Okay, World 10. Now, this is going to be a long video, so get ready. But I have to comment. This is like the third time I've done this. Because it's hard to try and explain what has happened with Chris Jericho and Kylie Ray, And the comments I've left on, I believe, my Dynamite review. Now, I want to make this clear. As I said in my Dynamite re comments, that I don't want to say anything until more information comes out. But I did leave a scenario that I do believe people are going to bring up. And I only brought that up because I do believe that someone's going to bring that up. But for me personally, I do not want to go beyond that. Because I know for a fact someone's going to bring that up. That's the reason why I left it there. But I'm going to wait until more information comes out. So if you leave a comment saying, what do you think about Kylie Ray and Chris? I'm going to say, look at this. Because I left a comment there and it was a possible thing what people may say. For me, I'm going to leave it. So I'm sure no one's going to listen, but I'm still doing it. Now, what did we get here in World's End? Full circle. That's what we got, full circle. For me personally, that's what we got here with MJF, with, um, with Eddie, Eddie Kingston, and a few other things that was going on. Full circle. Sort of. Opening. Let me um, let me give it to like this. Was this a good show overall? It was good. The camera work was good. The audio was good. Do we got to say that there was a lot of cursing in this show? Boy, there was so much cursing. People were saying "fuck shit," "fuck you," and other stuff that I don't even remember. There was a lot of it. So was this good for the general? You know, public? I don't know. It's going to depend on you who's watching it. It depends if you're a full-grown adult or a kid. There's going to be people not going to be very fond of seeing that the kids are going to a wrestling show and it's very cursy. So if you want something that's not as cursy, go to NWA, go to MLW, go to WWE. Even Impact doesn't really do any cursing, which will transition to TNA unless they change that in 2024 AEW is very raw, so you're going to hear a lot of cursing, which you did. But other than that, it wasn't bad. Kickoff, we got Willow Nightingale. I don't know why this match happened. I'm going to be truthful here. There was no build, from what I understand, there was no build on Collision. There was no build on Dynamite. I don't know if there was a build on Rampage. If there was, it never filtered over to Collision and never filtered over to Dynamite. I never saw it. So it felt empty. Hearing Halfway say that that Chris Statlander doesn't need to be friends with Willow because Willow's saying that she's better than her, especially after the street fight. It doesn't have a build. It didn't feel like anything. So when you get a match between two new island girls from Long Island, one part of Long Island to another, you got Halfway at commentary. It didn't feel like anything. It felt like it was tacked on at the last minute. Just to let Willow and Chris Statlander have a match. Was it a bad match? No. I know Chris Statlander. Well, actually, I should take that back. The beginning of the match was fine. The end of the match was sloppy. I'll be honest about that. It was Willow who had a major problem. She got tanked near the end because they were very physical. And Willow who tried to powerbomb a Chris Statlander who's either her weight or near her weight. And I'm not even saying... Willow's a heavy set woman. She's a solid woman. Let's make this clear. Willow is like a power lifter. She is solid. Chris Statlander is a very solid woman too. I can't say how, how much they weigh. Maybe 180, 170. They're not like women. They're at least near the weight. I know that um, Nala Rose is nearly 200 pounds. She's very heavy for a woman of her size. Unless she's like Awesome Kong, who's like 250 or more. She was solid as well. But essentially speaking, those two women are nearing 200, like 160 to 180. They're not light. So Willow had a problem trying to lift up Statlander more than a few times and tried to power bomb her a whole bunch of times, at least two times, and basically couldn't do it and kept landing her on her head. It was sloppy. But it was an okay match for the most part before that. And it was Willow who won there. But I don't see anything useful there because if the story wasn't filtered onto Collision 
or onto dynamite and it was last minute before the, the world's end happened, it feels like nothing. It's just a match with almost no story that makes any sense. Let's move on. And here, you see my, see, see my wonderful, wonder, wonderful face. I'm trying to be close to the camera as possible because it is late. I got new neighbors and I don't want to disturb them. Hopefully I'm not disturbing them. Next, the 20 man battle royal. Got a lot of people there. And it reached a point where, well, in the opening, we had Lance Archer who came back and Luchasaurus, now Kill Switch, come out. And before the match happens, everybody decides to beat the crap out of both of them and bury them on the chairs and tables so they can have the best shot. But by near the end of the match, when there was only Danhausen and Trent, you also had um, Lance Archer, who eventually got eliminated, and Kill Switch, who managed to eliminate everybody else and win the match. Well, I think Danhausen did get eliminated by um, Trent. Yeah, Trent did eliminate Danhausen. But when it came down to it, it was Kill Switch, Luchasaurus, who won. I'm going to keep doing Kill Switch Luchasaurus until he goes back to Luchasaurus because I think he's better as Luchasaurus, not Kill Switch. That's me. But when this happened, I was wondering how far they're going to go in the. Hmm. How far are they going to go? That's how I felt. Will they really go that far with Luchasaurus, Christian, and Adam and Copeland? Will they go that far? I didn't know. I was curious. Now, the match, final match of the kickoff, Wheeler Yuta versus Hook for the FTW title. Now, I'm going to be honest here. Yes, Hook is a New York boy. He's from my neck of the woods. He's from New York, just like his dad, Taz. I could easily say we got a lot of New Yorkers in this show that either didn't make it or did. And I'm going to be honest here. I want a Hook to lose. You know Why? It's time to retire the FTW title. I'm sorry. You have too many titles. Until you get rid of them all, the FTW title needs to go away. They only keep it on there because of Taz. I'm sorry. Because, yes, Hook is doing well, but... Well of what? He doesn't really do that many matches. And he should be working, doing something else. I'm sorry, he should be. The FTW title has done what it needs to do. It helped Ricky Starks. It helped Hook. I forgot who else had it. Brian Cage, it did help him a little bit. But it's run its course. It needs to be retired. That's why I was hoping Willie Uta would win it because then he would get rid of it. But he didn't win. He didn't. It was more of a a false count. Well, not false count anywhere match. It well, Yeah, it was more like a false count anywhere type of match. No DQ. And honestly... Basically like a street fight. And basically it was alright. But really, I think this is really to give Hook a chance to know what it was like to do what a match his father used to do. Like a street fight or a false count anywhere match because he's never really done much of it. So that's what I think this match was for. To give him an understanding what extreme wrestling is like. But at this point he needs to retire. They need to retire that title. He got too many titles and it's not really doing anything. It's ornament. Hook wins. I still wish the title was gone. That's just me. Now, eight-man tag. Now, this had all the participants, generally, who were in the... Hmm. They had everybody who was in the Continental Classic. And they went up against each other. Not to really gain anything, but just to have a spot on the show. And it was the opening. And we got... Um, King, Roosh, Jay White, and Jay Lethal. And then we had, well, Danny Garcia. Was, um, sorry, Brody King, my mistake. You got Brody King, um, both, um, Jays, Jay White, and Jay Lethal, and Roosh. And then you have Sam, you got, um, Mark Briscoe, you got Claudio, you have Brian Danielson, and you had Daniel Garcia. The person who looked the best there was Daniel Garcia. 
He just did. And he broke his... He was bleeding pretty good from his nose. So the match was okay. There were a couple of moments where you get a little worried that they were being a little more rougher than they should. And Daddy Magic was on commentary. So it was okay. He did get nailed after the match was over. And that was Garcia getting the pin over Jay Lethal. I noticed that. Jay Lethal has been eating a lot of pins lately. Kind of wondering, is his contract is near, is his contract nearing end? I'm wondering because, as I said before, Jay Lethal has done what he can. I mean, you had Jeff Jarrett having to do, um, well, having to do hosting in the beginning of the kickoff before the actual match before Statlander and and Willow because Halfway had to go and do something beforehand. So I'm like. I want to see J.D. Lethal leave. Either go to NWA, go back to MLW, or go to TNA. That's when I feel he should go, because there ain't that much. Next, next match. This one was a little confusing. Not because of the ending, but because... Why here? Why here? Because you could have put this on Dynamite or Collision. Why was it on the show? That's Miro versus Andrade. And I got to say this. I'm very happy that CJ is all right. We do know that CJ had a splinter in her finger. And she got an extremely bad infection. That was became a blood infection. Luckily, she survived. They had to do surgery. Maybe they had to remove part of her finger. It might have been gangrene. You never know. Because I can tell you for... Honestly, I've had gangrene. You can die from that. I almost did when I was a teenager. I'm not going to say where I had the gangrene, but I had gangrene and I had to have a, um, a removal of one of my body parts. I'm not going to say where. But I can tell you if she got gangrene, that means maybe part of her finger has been removed. I'm hoping not, but she did have a bad infection. I'm just glad that she's okay. She looks sexy and black. But here's the thing. Andrade is supposed to be the bad guy here. And I still believe this should have been on Dynamite or Collision. But since, and this was the problem of the entire match, this should have been on Dynamite, it should have been on Collision, and it should have happened many, many weeks from now. Because now that she came back, now that CJ was healthy enough to come back, they should have continued the story before they had the match because there's a lot of content missing. Guys, you have the match. You see CJ screaming and yelling at her husband, cursing him out. But it feels like it needed to be more fleshed out beforehand between Andrade and CJ. Because this isn't about CJ and Miro. This is about Andrade and CJ because we don't see the interaction between them other than when they go to the rink. We don't see them interact as friends or when he hugs her or nothing. So when you see this match nearing the end, and it was a decent match. It was not a bad match. You see CJ basically sweep the arms out of Andrade, who's trying to do the figure eight on her husband. And basically he wins and then she's blowing kisses at him. Afterward, you realize the story wasn't that good. Mainly due to the fact that CJ was not there. And instead of saying, okay, CJ's back. We can't do this here. We need to make the story correct. Because we need to give more time with CJ and Andrade to actually interact so the story will make sense. Not there. Now she's blowing kisses at him. And we do not see Andrade El Elio get angry at her after he lost the match to the game over. We just see her smiling at the screen Blowing kisses at her husband. Now, I know someone's going to say, well, that's the purpose. She did this to, to try and make it mean something. Well, here's the problem. Until you see it fleshed out so you know she's trying to set it up for him, it still looks incomplete. No matter if you fill in the gaps yourself, you're supposed to see it on TV, not to fill in the gaps yourself. No one says you can't speculate. But you need to see the progression of it. And it's not there. Moving on. Taste is Tony Storm versus Riho. 
Now, the vid pack for them, they showed in the beginning of the show on the kickoff was fine. Seeing that she talked about Riho being the first champion said not bad, but now she's going to be the best champion, I understand it. But, let's make this clear. This should not be Riho. I'm sorry. Riho should not be the one going against my taste as Tony Storm. She should be Soraya, or it should be easily Ruby Soho. One of them would have made more better sense. It makes no sense with Rio. You got an automatic story with Soraya. You have an automatic story with Ruby Soho. She betrayed them both. But what 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 do we have here? We have nothing with that. We got none of it. We got nothing with Soraya. And weirdly enough, when Soraya seems like she was going to go up against somebody that could have led her to Tony Storm, it didn't happen. And then Rio comes back, and then all of a sudden they realize Rio's not good enough by herself, so they had to stick Soraya with her, which she jobs, and it still feels empty. Now, I'm not saying the match quality was bad. I've always said the women still do great matches, but still the match quality was not the issue. The storytelling is. And if you say it's still great without the, the storytelling, then why are you watching this? Watch WWE. Because this doesn't have anything. People who like pro wrestling want more story. It's one of the reasons why RH had major problems, no matter what anyone says. RH never had very good stories. They had too much wrestling, not enough stories, characters, and gimmicks. You need to balance it. Sometimes you may go a little kilter on either one, but you still need it. And we didn't get it. That's why OH went under. It wasn't just because of the pandemic. Here, AEW has a major issue with the women. Again, as I said, they don't have stories. They don't got anything for the... Riho finally speaks Japanese and gets subtitles. Why haven't they done anything with Riho on Dynamite? Or... Emi Sakura or Hiro Kushida. I mean, once in a while they do something with Hiro Kushida because she's going to be with other women who speak English when she can... Hiro Kushida can speak fucking English. She speaks it better than fucking me. And they don't give her any time on, on Dynamite or Rampage. I mean, well, maybe Rampage, but not on Dynamite and not a collision to talk. No vid packs for her. Nothing for Emi Sakura, nothing for Riho. You got three Japanese wrestlers, whether they go back and forth, it's irrelevant. You don't make them feel like anything. And as much as people love their wrestling, I want to see them have fucking characters. You know who won? Tony Storm won. Period. And then we get uh, Mariah May coming out and throwing rose petals around her. And then she started swimming in it onto the mat, which makes perfect sense with her. Because she's a diva and she loves to feel in power. In, in, she feels like she's a diva. She can have anything she wants. Fine with it. It looks like she did bleed or it, that was her um, lipstick. I don't know what it was. Next. Here's a match that should never happened. And if anybody says you're wrong, explain in the in the comments. Explain it. Swerve Strickland versus Dustin Rhodes. Now, supposedly, and this is valid, Keith Lee had been injured for a while, but finally that injury caught up with him and he was not cleared. So they had to switch it with, 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 with Dustin. They had, they had no choice. They had no choice but to switch it with Dustin. So Dustin did the match. And they had a nice beginning. Dustin got his ass kicked. And what did they do? They tried to set up that Dustin's ankle was going to get destroyed by a cinder block. It gets nailed. And instead of him limping away and then ending the match, which could have gave Swerve Strickland something extra, since there was no Keith Lee that didn't make any sense in the first place, and I'll get to that in a minute, that didn't happen. He get his, he get his ankle hit, which went pretty much 
one swerve lands on it because he goes from the top turnbuckle. No, was it the um, turnbuckle or was it the ring skirt? I can't remember. If I got a shot of it, you'll see it. Since I'm putting images in here. But essentially, he should have left. But no, he went back into the ring. He kept wrestling and then he acted like there was no pain. Yes, eventually he did win, Swerve Strickland. Yes, he did. He did win. But let's make this 100% clear. This should have never happened. You know why? I'm going to make this clear to anyone. Because I know there's going to be people that's not going to understand about Swerve. Where he should have never had a feud with Keith Lee in the first place. Because honestly, the feud between him and Keith Lee, no matter if they have history, had no build. You got Keith Lee only beating Brian Cage. He does not beat the other members of the mobile affiliates. Well, mobile embassy, not affiliates. Mobile embassy. He only beats Brian Cage. He doesn't beat the other guys in the Gates of Agony. So there's no story. Nothing. Now, if you say, well, they were beaten. Where was that? Was it all H? If it was all H, that's bullshit. Because it should have been on Collision. Or it should have been on Dynamite. If we don't see it because it's on freaking Honor Club, which you have to pay a separate price compared to AEW television, how would you fucking know? Think about it. If he's only beaten one member of the mobile embassy, why would Swerve even deal with him after he loses in the Continental Classic? He should be moving on to someone else. Not Keith Lee. And because they stuck him with Keith Lee, who was injured, look what happened. They threw Keith Lee at him because they had nothing for him to do. Instead of him going away for a little while, maybe a couple of weeks, afterward, then come back and then you give him a story. You throw Keith Lee at him because you want to give him something at World's End. And guess what? Keith Lee couldn't work. So then you throw Dustin at him, and instead of just destroying Dustin's ankle and let him going away for a while, so put over Keith Lee, no, not Keith, you, you see I'm getting angry, put over Swerve Strickland, not Keith, sorry guys, I'm getting angry. Instead of making him, get rid of him, then you can bring back a Dustin Rhodes who has been screwed over by Swerve Strickland twice after getting hurt a second time because of him. No, you have a match where eventually Swerve wins. This was wrong. This made no sense. And I'm sure maybe JD and Alex would be fine with it, but not me. It had no story. Keith Lee had no story with Swerve because he didn't go through the entire Mono, Mogul uh, and See, I'm calling it Mogul Village when I mean Mogul Embassy. I'm sorry, it's making me angry. This was just bad booking. Moving on. Eight-man tag. This is where I was getting very curious to see how the fans were going to react. Because we had Alan, Sting, Sammy, and Chris Jericho. Yes. I'm not going to give my opinions like I said in the beginning of this video. If it's real or if it's not what was being stated by Kylie Ray. I'm not. I just wanted to find out what the reaction of the fans were going to be. Then we had the Don Collis family with the tag champs, which had Hobbs and Kateska. I'm not going to lie, the match was sloppy. It was a bit sloppy. But, this is where it gets interesting. Two things stuck out. One, Sammy Guevara looked good during the match. Of course he did. This is one of the first matches him coming back after concussion and being a father. So he looked good. Then we got the reaction to the fans with Chris Jericho. Most cheered him when he came out and sang his song. But as the time went on, they started booing him. They were booing him, guys. They started to boo him. That is a big thing. They even were cheering Big Bill as he beat the crap out of him. So this was very interesting to see the dynamic of how the fans feel about the reaction of the rumor. Does not mean, and I'm making it clear again, I'm not saying the rumor is true or it's not true. I'm not commenting on it. I'm just giving you the reaction of what was done at, at Nassau Coliseum. That's what happened. In the end, the faces won. 
And it was Sammy who got the pin on... Who did he get the pin on? Um, Ricky Starks, I believe. Ricky Starks is the one that got the pin on... Got pinned by Sammy Guevara. And this... And this makes it even more important. The last thing. Seeing this is the last match for Sting in New York. They're still building up until March. We only got a few more months before Sting fully retires from the ring. This was the last match. I'm not going to say this was very great to see because Sting looked great. He was able to work in the ring. He didn't look bad. He actually looked very good. But being a guy who never did see Sting in WCW, I never did. I never got a chance to see it because I wasn't able to watch wrestling at that time because I was married and my wife didn't like wrestling and I was busy. I was working the majority of the time. So I barely saw any wrestling. If I did, it was extremely rare. So I never got a chance to see Sting in his heyday. I got to see him in TNA. So I got to see him at the tail end of his career. And now I got to see him here at the last parts of his career. And I'll be able to do a review of him, hopefully, at Revolution. So it's kind of bittersweet for me. If I was at the Nassau, I believe it's Nassau Coliseum. If I had been there, it would have been wonderful to see him before he went away. At least from the ring. Doesn't mean he couldn't become a commentator. Doesn't mean he couldn't become a manager. And doesn't mean he couldn't take care of talent in the back or be a general manager. Never know. Let's move on. Next match. The match I had no feeling for at all. Does not mean the match quality was bad. Abaddon versus Julia Hart. Here's where it's interesting. Where do we get having Abaddon go against Julia Hart? Supposedly out of the last 24 matches she's done, she's won all 23. Where is that? Tell me below where you, you, you've seen her. Was it on Dynamite? No. Was it on Rampage? Maybe. Was it on Collision? No. Was it on RHTV? Maybe. But which ones do you watch? This is a good question for anyone who watches. What shows do you watch? you watch all four? Does that mean you're spending money watching AEW content and ROH? And if you get the app, that's like 5 or $10. And if you do Honor Roll, that's at least 5 or $10. At least one of the two. Most people don't do that. They hedge their bets. They'll watch Collision, hopefully, or to watch Dynamite, or to watch them both. They don't watch all the time all H. Unless it's just exclusive. Unless they got a lot of money on top of that. And they very rarely watch Rampage. Very few people do. So, hearing that she had all these wins, I didn't know anything about her. And the vid pack didn't help either. The vid pack that showed both her and Abaddon, Abaddon being the way Abaddon is, being that it sounds like she's binary because they say that she's they, the zombie girl is a they. Usually a person who's a they is a binary. So she's like um, Maxine Paler who believes she's a binary. And isn't. That's how she feels. She's a binary. So we get Abaddon as a binary. And we have no build for her. So when you look at this match. And you see that Sky Blue helped out a Julia Hart. It doesn't feel really important. Now we did get some cheers from the fans when it came to the match. Because they said this is creepy. No this is scary and this is creepy. I can't remember. I think it's scary. So we got a couple of cheers of that. So they were somewhat into the match. And it was not that bad. And I'm telling you right now. Abaddon, I've seen very little of her, so I can't say she's done great. But when it comes to Julia, she has improved immensely when it comes to her psychology of matches. It's not about just her ring work. It's how she works in the match. How she presents her, her character. How she's stone cold. Or that she gets a thrill out of how she has no way to win, but she's enjoying it. That shows how well Julia Hart has developed. I just wish they would have more stories for her and more better matches. Because, 
essentially speaking, it was not that Abaddon's match was bad. We just didn't care. Or I should say, I didn't care. Because I, I, I don't see Abaddon. She only just showed up in the last couple of weeks. I'm just saying. Now, time to flip on to the next page. There's so much content. Now, the next match, and I believe this was one of the best match. Second best match of the night for me personally. Second best. I'm saying it right now. It's the second best. The TNT title match. Christian versus a Adam Copeland. The rated R Madman Superstar. No DQ. No count outs. Anything goes. Which, that's what happened. We got a very, very physical match. That kind of made me a little nervous about both these guys. Look, Christian went away from wrestling for many years because of concussion issues. Adam went away because of concussion, but mostly because of a triple neck fusion. It made me a little nervous how rough they were in this match. And they were cursing their asses off at each other. They they, they didn't give a fuck. Even though they love each other's like family, like brothers, legitimately brothers, they were cursing at each other. This is where, in this situation, cursing worked. And I'm glad it happened. It was very, very well done. Yes, we also, pretty much, let's make this clear. The match was three on one. Because you had Christian, you had Shane Wayne, and you have Nick Wayne. And pretty much that's what we got. Shane she, she didn't really do much. Maybe pu- she did pull the ref out once. And that was nearing the end of the match. But Nick is one who did the majority of any work if it wasn't Christian himself. We did not get to see Kill Switch. Not until the end of the match. But we got a lot of very violent, dangerous types of spots. And... In this situation, it worked well, but for me personally, it still made me a bit nervous. These guys have been known to get concussions, and pretty much Adam has a triple neck fusion. I was concerned that he may go a little too far with this and may hurt himself. Also, I kind of wish that Beth was there. His wife Beth had been there. I wish she was, but she wasn't, of course, because it would have been good to have her against Shane, Shane well, um, Nick Wayne's mother. Shayna, I believe her name is Shayna. It would have been nice to see her there, but it's what we had. So, the show was very good in this match. The showing was good in this match. In the end, what did we get? We get Adam winning the TBS championship. That lasted maybe about two minutes. Roughly about a minute and a half to two minutes. Because once he won and hold the title over his head... We get Kill Switch nailing him behind the head. He's got the contract in his hands and he's ready to cash it in, but he cannot. Why? And I think this is what's going to piss off a lot of people. And I understand why. Because Christian demanded the contract because it was unsigned. He held the contract unsigned. And he's saying to Christian, This is my time. This is my contract. He says, No, no. Give it to me. Give it. He's telling him something in his ear. And he's going. And probably got a shot of it. It's in my face. And then he hands the damn contract over. And walks away. And Christian spears. A Adam Copeland. And regains the title. And I know a lot of people in that place. Were so mad. And at first I was as well. I was very upset. This was happening. But I had to remember. Adam and Jay, Christian, came up with this storyline for themselves. This isn't just a Tony storyline. This is an Adam and Jay storyline. Adam Copeland and Jay, Christian, came up with this story. So when it comes down to it, this is a story they want to tell. Do I believe it's something I would have written or booked? No. I wouldn't have written it like this, but we don't know what's coming next. And I'm going to keep an open mind, at least on this situation. But I 100% understand why people are angry because you could have delayed this 
by a week. But, or two weeks, the build up kill switch. That's the reason I would not 100% agree with it if I didn't see it that this is Christian and Adam's story. They, they made the request to write it themselves. They made the request that this is the way they want to book it. So I had to step, take a step back from being a fan and say, dude, what about Kill Switch? I would have liked to see him build up into it. And even if he had to still hand in the, the contract, I would have loved to see something for him. But that's just me. Second match of the night. That was the match of the night for me personally. I'm sorry. Anyone else? If you didn't feel like it. Actually, no, 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 no. You know what? I'm not doing this. Third best match of the night. MGF and Joe. For the world championship. MGF has a torn leg room, I believe. Somewhere around here. It is torn and he's still working. So when it comes down to it. The way it worked. You got Joe coming out as the classic heel. You got MJF who did a vid pack talking about, well, him not talking about, but people in Long Island basically saying that this is the time he is our scumbag with the scarves. And one guy, because everyone else saying he's our scumbag, one guy said, holding the, tie, holding the, the um, scarf. I'm not going to say that. And then two guys come from behind, beat the crap out of him. And then later in that vid pack, he says, he's my scumbag, beaten up. I felt that was a nice touch. Once he comes out, he has on his robe the most magical place on earth with his arms open. I don't know if I got the shot. I probably don't. I probably got him walking out. But it was a good match. Well constructed. Strategy was good. Showing that Samojo focused on his right shoulder. What was it? Right shoulder or left shoulder? I can't remember. I think it was his right shoulder. Hammering it. and try No, his left shoulder. My mistake. Hammering his shoulder to make him not be able to do what he needs to do. Like the salt of the earth or the heat seeker correctly. He focused on his left arm. Which was very good. In the end. And I know I'm skipping someone on purpose. I haven't forgotten him. But nearing the end. Samoa Joe chokes out a MJF because his arm is being held up. One, two, and then three, when he drops, the ref going, uh, uh, he doesn't raise his arm. Uh, what do I do? Oh, ring the bell. It was like, and people noticed that the ref was like, um, is he messed up and he let him count three. But that was it. MJF lost. Samoa Joe wins. He is now the current champion. He didn't even need to cheat. Samoa Joe whooped his ass clean. He didn't need to cheat. He didn't need to. It wasn't necessary because he's that much of a badass. That is Samoa Joe. And I buy it. The question is going to be for Joe, is he going to be booked correctly going forward in 2024? I don't know. But now, the part that's going to end this. This is about Adam Cole, who was at ringside right before the match started, which pissed off some old Joe. And when it was over, he gets into the ring and says to MGF, you got nothing to be ashamed of. Everyone said it was bullshit here. He agreed that was bullshit. You worked your ass off. You did great. And he kept encouraging him throughout the entire match. And he was happy for MGF, supposedly. At least until the devil groups come out. And then MJF is going to Adam, get back, get back. Because Adam has his cane, not his cane, but his, his crutches. And he's trying to protect him. They attack MJF. They grab Adam Cole and... The guy who's holding the chair is about to hit Adam Cole, but it's MGF who's screaming, hit me. Don't hit Adam. And Adam's saying, hit me. They're both doing that, but then the lights go out. And then we see the lights on. And as everyone figured it, because it was a very strong possibility, which I didn't agree, didn't say, didn't, didn't disagree with it. I thought it was a good chance it would be him. He was sitting on the chair. He pulls his hair back 
And Adam Cole is the one who is the devil. And he has everyone whooped the fuck out of an MJF. Stands over him, smiling. MJF has no titles. And the ones that are wit Adam Cole is OGK, Bennett and Matt Taven, Roderick Strom, and Warlow. That one I didn't expect. But I'm glad it happened. Because it makes sense for Warlow to join them. They all destroyed him. That's why it's full circle. It makes perfect sense. They closed the show with that. And that's the third best match of the night for me personally. But this is the first. And it was the only one I was waiting for. The only one I cared about. The Continental Classic match. (sighs) Guys, for me personally, seeing Eddie Kingston go full circle makes me happy. For me, makes me happy. We got Moxley. We got Brian Danielson on commentary. And we got Eddie Kingston against A. Moxley. His best friend and one of his, well, not contemporary, well, yeah, pretty much a contemporary of him. Even though he probably started a bit later than Brian Danielson. And earlier, easily, than Moxley. He's got two people he respects that is at ringside and in the ring. And this match was wonderful. It was magical. Because not just of the strategy of the match and how it was constructed, but how heavily Eddie Kingston is over with the fans. Look, no matter how much Adam Copeland that he won... Let's make this clear. The fans were more for Eddie. Of course, he's a home he's a hometown boy, of course. But Eddie is that over, even no matter where he's gone. Eddie has been over more than anybody. And next to the um what was the guy's name? Uh what was the guy's name? Mad Mac? Mad Mac. What was the guy's name? I'm sorry, the guy that is Eddie's friend who's also a pro wrestler that passed away. There's two actually that passed away. I don't remember the names because they said them so briefly. But one of them, Eddie knew, and he dedicated the match of the Continental Classic Finals to his friend, which I respect. And that match was so well done. And when Eddie finally did get that hurricane, when I saw Eddie do that back fist hurricane to Mox, I said, oh, that's over. It's done. He hit the floor the way he did. I said, he's done. And he won. I was happy. I legitimately was happy because for me personally, When I look at Eddie, I have seen him in NWA. I've seen him in Impact Wrestling. I've seen him here in AEW. And to be honest, I've also seen his, um, like, a little documentary of his life. And I've always felt that Eddie is one of those few wrestlers who has got it. But he never got the opportunity to show it. That's the thing that many people understand. You could have the best wrestler on the planet. You could have a Hulk Hogan or Ric Flair or Ricky the Dragon Steamboat or a Roman Reigns or a Brian Danielson. It doesn't make a difference. Or Adam Copeland. These guys could be the greatest wrestlers that you could ever see. But if they're never on a grand stage, you'll never know. You'll only hear rumors about it. Or you'll say, oh, I've seen them. They're greater than anybody. But it means nothing until they get to a real place that will spotlight them and even more. Believe in them. This is what people do not understand. Like with Swerve Strickland. As much as people say Swerve is so great, and he is. I love Swerve. Even though he doesn't sell very well. I do love Swerve now. But when I saw him in WWE, didn't care. Because they, even though NXT had booked him correctly, does not mean I believed in him. Because the company didn't believe in him. And when they got rid of him and he went to AEW, people believed in him. But I didn't because they didn't give me a reason to believe in him. Even though I knew he had good ring work, very good character development. He, he can put on a character great. He could make 
it means something, but until the company really gets behind them, why would you care? No matter how much you personally, like myself, like with Eddie Kingston, the Mad King, I could be behind him, but until the fans get behind him and the company believed in him, it means nothing. Look what happened with the perfect 10, Ty Dillinger. He got over, but they got rid of him because they didn't like it that he got over. Look at Zack Ryder. He got over as the first person to really take advantage of the internet as a pro wrestler. He got over and they didn't believe in him. And look at him now. Here's the same thing. Eddie Kingston has gone through multiple companies like All H. He's gone through, he's gone through Impact Wrestling. He's gone now to AEW. Never went to WWE. But all those companies, they cared about him, but they could not get behind him. Or fully behind him. So now he's given the Triple Crown Championship and he's the Continental Champion. AEW, New Japan Pro Wrestling have gotten behind him. They trust him enough with their titles, at least for now. And I believe in Eddie. I always knew he had the ability, but it had to be the company to really get behind him. And the fans. The fans got behind him and eventually the company got behind him. And that's when you know this person has finally made it. And now, as much as Simone Joe is going to be doing great as champion, at least until they make him drop it, the second best person in the company is not Adam Copeland. And understand, I love, I love Adam. It's going to be Eddie. As the face right now, he's the best face they got. And he also could be the one to run collision. I'm saying it now. If they're smart, as a Triple Crown champion, as the one who has the first Continental Championship, the New Japan Pro Strong title, and yes, the OH World Championship, he must be put on collision and made important. When he does, collision could mean something. But that's if they go there, which I don't know if they will. But this is just me. And I hope you enjoy my review of... World's end. I hope my audio has been working. As far as I know, my audio should be working. My camera is working. If I'm missing something, I'm not going to be happy. I'll have to refilm it. Peace and Happy New Year. I don't know if I'm going to do a video tomorrow for New Year's Eve. If I do do a video, I'll upload it for New Year's Day. Peace.